Joining us again on the Fox News Rundown is North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, one of the Republicans running for president. Great to see you again, Governor. Yeah, fantastic to be here. Thanks for having me back on again. Obviously, the world's focus is on what's going on in the Middle East. You have the war, Israel going against Hamas terrorists. It'll be day 12. And President Biden is going to be in Israel. He's going to meet with the prime minister. He's going to meet with the Palestinian president, leaders of Jordan and Egypt. Your reaction to the trip? Well, I think it doesn't matter where Joe Biden is. The reason why we're in this mess is because of the policies. And when we announced uh, on back on June 7th, we said three things, Ener- energy, economy, national security, and that Joe Biden was 180 degrees wrong on all those and what's unfolded over the last four months. I mean, if you're going to give $6 billion to the world's largest supporter of terrorism in exchange for five Americans, you just made the world less safe. You basically put a price tag on hostages. And I said to my team, the second that came out, I said, well, guess what? Now that we're subsidizing American hostage taking, we're going to see more hostage taking. And when you keep subsidizing, and then this summer, uh, unbeknownst to everybody, people aren't even paying attention. What happened? Iranian oil exports started skyrocketing and they're selling their oil. I mean, over a million barrels. So the sanctions were basically being lifted by the Biden administration because they weren't being enforced. So they have all that money pouring in. That's way bigger than the $6 billion. And who's buying it? China's buying it because China is refilling their strategic petroleum reserve. And then Iran, we know, is supplying it's put, they're supplying armed drones to Russia. So guess what? We're in a cold war with China. We're in a hot proxy war with Russia. We're in, now we're in a proxy war with Iran. And Joe Biden is shoveling billions of dollars either directly or by lifting sanctions on Iran to the people that are funding. He's funding both sides of this war. And but so the administration, what, Governor, says that not a penny of that money was spent and that that, that that money has not been involved in what's going on with Hamas at all. Yeah, well... <laughs> It, it's just, I mean, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I mean, that's such a joke. I mean, it's so impossible that they would actually stand in front of a microphone and say that because apparently they've, I mean, I guess if you've never worked a day in the private sector, you wouldn't understand about the fungibility of dollars. If we give them $6 billion for humanitarian, that frees up $6 billion to go towards funding terrorism. And we know that they, the Iranians were involved in these attacks, plotting them for over a year. And so, again, he, he can go... The over president and, denies that. He says, that, well, no, he, he said that they haven't uncovered that exact link yet or whatever it was yeah yeah so okay does anybody believe that i mean i mean but again this is the problem there's no credibility because we we know that they have been working on a path of appeasement that goes all the way back to the obama administration the same woke somehow idea that if we appease uh this this regime which is oppressing its own people that somehow the world is going to be safer and more stable and so you just got to everybody's got to ask themselves not just americans but if you're an israeli if you're a ukrainian if you're anywhere in western europe you know where energy prices have gone through the roof ask yourself if you're better off today than you were when joe biden took office because no you're paying more for everything because of inflation the world is less stable because of his appeasement policies and then we're in this the thing which we have to change we're basically now with lifting sanctions on Venezuela yesterday, which is completely also crazy. You know, we're, he, they're pursuing a path, uh, you know, call it America last, call it what you want to call it. But it's, we're, they're basically saying instead of us selling energy to our friends and allies, which would stabilize the world and improve the environment, we're buying oil and gas from our enemies. That's what he's trying to do. I mean, why else? I mean, you're, you're getting the sanctions lifted on Venezuela so they can compete with the U.S. industry you're trying to kill. I mean, he's, they're, they're, they have a, there's another war going on. The war is the Biden administration against the U.S. energy industry. Gas prices are down like 30 cents in a month, though, they might point out. So <laughs> they might say that they're having some success fighting inflation, bringing prices down. Yeah, well, they're trying to kill the U.S. energy industry, and then they're trying to solve the supply problem by having foreign suppliers like Venezuela and like Iran put their barrels onto the world market, which are produced less cleanly than ours. And at the same time, they've got this facade of trying to hold on to some voters saying, oh, we're the clean, we're the green party. Uh, you know, the Biden administration, we're the, vote for us. We're trying to clean up the environment, which is just also a complete joke. Because if you get a, if you get a switch to an EV battery that's subsidized by other hardworking taxpayers, and you're going to subsidize those cars, but not subsidize the workers, a.k.a. the UAW strike. But it, it, China controls 85% of the rare earth minerals in the world. They're called rare earth a reason because they're measured in parts per million and so that china's tearing up the whole planet whether it's indonesia whether it's africa to get these you know child labor in a cobalt mine in africa so that we can buy a subsidized battery but you know where that battery is made in china it's made in a plant powered by coal 
The Washington Post ran an article last week praising China about their, their faster shift to EVs and how great this was. And the whole article never mentioned that every one of those cars is being charged by electricity generated in a coal plant. Would President Burgum change the trajectory toward EVs? I know there are a lot of states that want by 2035 all new vehicles to be electric. Well, I just would ask them, you know, if states, states can pass their own laws, if they want to pass, you know, brownout and blackout laws for their grid, if they want to saddle everybody in their state with something that is less green, at more expensive, destabilizes the grid, uh, and... <clears throat> And it and drives, you know, every hospital and every place else to have to put in a diesel generator because the grid is so destabilized. If you want to do that, I imagine states could do that, but it's not good for national security. I mean, at the time, at the time that Russia invaded Ukraine, we were offloading 400,000 barrels of oil a day from Russia, dirty Russian heating oil into New England, places like New Hampshire have the highest percentage of homes that are heated by by heating oil still in America. Why? That's less clean than natural gas because the Biden administration, you can't get a permit. The state of New York will block it. You can't get a clean natural gas pipeline from the Marcellus in Pennsylvania up into New England. That's a national security issue when we're at a point, we're heading towards World War III and we still have parts of our country that are importing foreign oil. Bad for the environment, bad for inflation, bad for working families, bad for American jobs. And, and again, as we've seen now, it's bad for the world order and stability. I mean, all these policies, economy, energy, national security, 180 degrees in the wrong. When I'm your president, we, will, we can fix all this stuff and fix it quickly. And every American life will get better when we do that. Not just for Republicans, every independent, every Democrat, everyone's life will be better because we'll stop, inflation will stop stealing your savings. It'll stop raising the cost of your living and we'll actually be cleaning up the environment because the U.S. produces energy cleaner, better, safer than anyone. You said we, we're headed toward World War III. We have the Hamas conflict. You've referenced Ukraine. You are a governor of a state that it's not a you know, small population compared to other states in the, in the country. You're running against someone who was the president, Donald Trump, who was the vice president, Mike Pence, someone who was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley. Foreign policy is a big deal right now. You're a governor. How do you stand up against them on those policies? I'd happy to deb debate any of them on foreign policy because guess what? I've had people working for me in over 100 countries around the world. I've had customers in 132 countries when I was a kid, when we were building a software company. I've had people that worked for me in those countries that didn't have the right to vote, didn't have the right to assemble, uh, didn't, didn't have the right to free speech. I understand how great America is, and I understand how the world economy works. We've got people on that stage that have never worked a day in the private sector. I don't care what they say their Washington experience is. Washington mm -hmm. got us into all these messes. What we need is someone who's got a clear perspective about how the economy works and how the world works. And, and someone who's been involved in the global economy understands that. There's people on that stage. Energy's at the heart of this. They're not from energy states. You know, we need food security. These people have barely been on a farm and a ranch. Technology's changing every job, every company, and every industry, and they've never worked a day in technology. So, again, when, when I say literally the most qualified guy on the stage is the least known one, that's me. And we've got to keep making our case to the American people because absolutely positively uh, that this, the, 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 I've got the qualifications, the experience, the capability to do that. And then take it right back to North Dakota. Guess who's got one of the largest nuclear ar arsenals in the country? The state of North Dakota. Guess who's got two of the three legs of the strategic triad, uh, the Minot Air Force Base, both bomber and missile wing. Guess who's leading all the, you know, the Global Hawk, global worldwide. Grand Forks, that's the Grand Forks Air Force Base and the Minot Air Force Base. So all of these things that we understand, and national security also starts with border security. I've been down to the border more than Biden has, and we've had, had North Dakota National Guard troops at the border throughout my time as governor, and they're down there flying night helicopter missions between you know, San Diego and the Gulf Coast trying to stop transnational, you know, or criminal organizations. What so, would you do at the border differently to change the record surge we've had of illegal crossings? Well, it has to be a full-fledged diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, all those things together. But I'd start with just the law enforcement. When I'm down there talking to the Border Patrol, anybody down there that has an option to take 
early retirement has done it. Because guess what? They basically are being defunded by the Biden administration. Positions that open up aren't being refilled. They can't get money to, to fix up security at the, where we're supposed to have regular legal ports of entry. And I know this. We're a border state, 365 miles on the northern border. They're pulling people off the northern border. And so we've got we've got border crossings that are closed in North Dakota because they're trying to pull staff you know, to fill holes on the southern border. And you talk to the law enforcement, the Border Patrol, guess, guess, who's, guess who's not on the border? The Border Patrol. Guess what they're doing? Paperwork. Not computer work, paperwork. Six and a half million people have come across under Joe Biden. That's the equivalent of every man, woman, and child in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, his home state of Delaware, throw in Montana. That gets you to the six and a half million asylum seekers that we're doing, we're paper on, and we don't know where they are. I mean, give them a piece of paper, bus ticket, away you right. go. And then you're down there meeting with them. There's another thing on their metric board called known gotaways. Known gotaways is a million and a half. Those are ones we've seen on camera that haven't received asylum paper. They've just walked we in. We don't know who they are. And then there's another number, which is does, which is a, not available, called unknown gotaways, because the bad guys disable our cameras. The Border Patrol is okay. back doing paperwork. The bad guys cross in the places where there's no cameras. So we know there's a million and a half that have seen on camera but had no contact. There's another unknown number. Is that another million and a half? Is it two million? Of the ones that we've papered that have come in, the asylum seekers, that's the sec- sector I was in in Texas, over 100 different countries, including every country that's on, got people on the terrorist watch list. And then they're exploiting these Biden policies that uh, the liberals think are like, oh, this is great. We're not doing family separation. Well, you come in and if you're a terrorist, you come in with a, an adolescent with you and you say, this is my son or daughter, and then we can't separate them. You know, how about we do a DNA swab and then actually, you know, take the people off the terror. The terrorist watch list crossings are up 54 percent under Joe Biden. So and then, of course, we're taking mass casualties because we've lost the equivalent of five Vietnams in the country to drug overdoses since he took office. I mean, we're closing in on 270,000 American deaths, overdoses, 70 percent of those are fentanyl poisonings. And so this is, uh, you know, I, I'll be down on the border in the first two weeks. Bo- Joe Biden took him two years to get there, but we will get the border secured. Uh, and that's t- step one, because we're going to be paying the price. You think about, you know, what if there's already a Hamas cell that's come across as part of this thing? They right. were planning this attack on Israel for more than a year. It, we, they've had two and a half years to get people into our country unknown. Uh, I, I'm afraid we're going to be paying the terrorist price in our own country because of this open border policy. Lastly, you mentioned you were the least known candidate. We've had two debates already. We have another one three weeks away in Miami. Higher thresholds for polling, higher thresholds for can, uh, for can, donations and donors and unique donors to the campaign. Are you going to be there? We'll be there. And we've, we've crossed the threshold for Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, and the donor threshold. All so we've got, oh, you mean donors or 4%, you mean? Donors and above 4% in Iowa, New Hampshire. So we've crossed all those three, and we've got left as the national, the national polling. Is it frustrating to see the polls and you're not there yet in the well, national stage? Well, I, I think on the national one, again, this is artificially trying to narrow the field before the voters get to. And the, the this whole uh, narrative that somehow we got to get the field down before voters get to decide. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt fought this over 100 years ago, which is, hey, it's not party bosses and media, the big newspapers of the time that decide who the candidates are. It ought to be the primaries. And, you know, I tell you, people in Iowa, New Hampshire, not happy about the the nationalization of the primary because they are the ones that are out there, you know, spending time with voters in their homes, in their backyards, at local town halls, you know, seeing candidates multiple times. They're the ones that are going to get to decide. And 98% of the delegates are still available after New Hampshire. So America should just, you know, hey, if you, if you, if you, maybe we should just cancel the NFL season too if people think that it's already over. If someone's already decided who's going to win the Super Bowl, I don't think Americans would be thrilled with canceling every game in the NFL and the playoffs because some pundit already decided who's going to win. Let the games be played out. Uh, we got we know five out of seven times in both Iowa and New Hampshire who was leading a month out wasn't the person that ended up uh, with the nomination. And so there's a lot of things that can happen between uh, now and then. And we're, we, uh, as I said, we're in New Hampshire. We're on the ballot. We're going to be on the ballot in Iowa. And we're looking forward to keep getting our name. We're the least well-known. When our name recognition goes up, our polling numbers go up. We'd be in the low teens right now if we had the same name recognition as some of these other folks that have 100% name recognition. Well, we'll keep following you on the campaign trail. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, Republican presidential candidate, thanks very much for joining us again. Fantastic. Great to be with you.